Good evening to all our friends out there, all the anglers, uh, and especially the four anglers members. Thank you for joining us for another edition of uh, On the Line With. And today we are talking something totally different. Today we are talking drones and saltwater fishing. And uh, we've got some of our distinguished guests here. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce um, Greg Kellerman. Greg is the owner of East Coast Angling Guides and uh, he's been into fishing and especially saltwater fishing for quite a long time. And um, Greg, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Lena. Nice to be here. Greg, just tell us a little bit about your, your fishing background and where you're from and what you, what you have done in your life before. Okay, so um, I've been fishing as, uh, as long as I can remember. And uh, grew up in East London, fished here my whole life, and then uh, spent quite a bit of time in the Western Cape, where I fished for Western Province for many years. Um, started a guiding business with a mate of mine there. We did that for, for a few years. Um, then I started repping for some of the big names in tackle. Then I owned a tackle shop, commercial tuna fishing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, eventually had to move back up to East London, um, where I started this guiding business as well as a uh, custom lure building business and uh, yeah so uh, fishing is my passion uh, it's basically all I think about <laughs> most days <laughs> well welcome with us uh, and um, we trust that we're gonna have a nice talk and share a lot of your experience with our viewers I hope it, I hope it can help <laughs> then we also have um, I'd also like to introduce Gary McDonough. He's the owner of Kuta Copter. And um, he's somebody that really moved the borders or um, taken South Africa into a quantum leap with respect to um, developments in terms of drones. Gary, welcome with us uh, tonight. Thank you, Gardner and team. And uh, hi there, Greg. Uh, happy to be here with you guys. Nice to see you again. <laughs> um, Gary, just a little bit about your business. What, what do you do? Are you only into drones? Uh, what is it that you keep yourself busy with? Oh, Ben, yes. Um, yeah, thinking back to 2014, when we first started this, the time has flown. And the drone business essentially came out of the radio control flying business. Uh, and we also had a aerial photography business using drones at one stage and uh, when the laws got a bit tight on the aerial photography we had to look at something else we didn't quite know where to go but we uh, had some fortunate uh, encounters with customers who suggested this to us and we took it on there and uh, it went forward from there so right now our main business is fishing drones but we're still very active in the racing drones, recreational drones, and just general drone flying in general um, for most people. Um, just on that side, how big is the, the racing drone side? So a racing drone event would attract probably between 15 and 40 competitors. It's not what I would call big. Um, compared to drone fishing, I would call it small. Uh, it's just amazing how uh, the angling community has taken to using a drone to boost their fishing experience. So as a ratio, I'd say drone angling is probably about 10 times bigger, um, for us at least, the way I see it, than normal drone flying. I'm, I'm just thinking of it. Jesse. Why would you want to go and race a drone if you can fly a drone out to catch some quality fish? <laughs> I suppose... Uh, one man's meat is another man's poison. So everybody has a different need in terms of how they want to entertain themselves. And uh, the, the thrill of the racing drone is really based on the, what they call the first person view experience where you feel like you're sitting in the drone and uh, then driving it around at high speed. So that would be the thrill of that. Obviously the thrill of the, uh, the drone for angling is more about the added anticipation that one finds uh, you have um, because you really have that belief that you are going to catch something amazing. Uh, that on its own is not just the, 
the drone angling side, most of our customers tell us they enjoy the, the, the experience of just flying the drone. It's an added part of the whole adventure. Uh, like making up your lures and traces. Now the drone flying is also part of that. I, I can imagine. Um, but in, in my experience, um, flying the drone is also always the, the part that I don't like at all because that fear of doing something wrong is, is always with me but in any case um greg just tell us drones has changed the the entire field um it's absolutely a game changer why why drones absolutely for you? um look i've had a passion for big fish my whole life and uh, although i do every other type of fishing that's been my absolute passion and um for many, many years, I did. I was um, relying on kites to uh, get our baits out, and essentially that means that there's a small window in winter where the wind is in your favour, and uh, when you can really sort of target crazy fish with really heavy tackle. And um, if you have a bad season and the offshores don't blow, then you severely limited. And for me, having a drone now just means that my uh, utilisation of time. When I get time and the conditions are right, it's like I can, I can go. You, you have your stuff ready and you go. You're not worrying about whether the wind's blowing in the right direction or whether it's going to drop or take 25 minutes to put your bait up with a cut. You know, it's a two and a half minute operation and you're fishing. So for me, that's been mind blowing. Just an absolute game changer. It's changed everything. The, way, the entire way I look about fishing for big fish, it's changed all of that. Yeah, so you can go down and put out two or three rods easily, quickly, and then relax and wait for the pickup. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing. With, with the conditions down in the East Coast, um, doesn't that close your, your window a little bit? Or, or how, how much wind can you take on with um, the drones that you use? Looking at a lot of the footage you've got here is actually of my very first drone that I got from Gary, which was a little hammerhead, um, which uh, couldn't take a hell of a lot of wind. Um, but to be honest with you, I, I think there was only a few times where um, it really could have kept me stranded without putting terrible baits out. I think the guys in Cape Town in particular, they, they're the guys who fly, are flying their drones in some crazy wind and uh, um, we're fairly lucky here. Um, I now have another prototype from Gary which is for me also obviously I can now fly it in far worse conditions but uh, I think the Cape Town guys are the guys who are flying their drones in some crazy winds. I mean, I don't, I don't even know, like 35, 40 k's an hour. Some, some mad stuff. Stuff where I'd probably stay at home. <laughs> um, Greg, it, it brings you a, a different um, experience and um, it makes so much more possible. So the footage that we're looking at here, um, just tell us a little bit about that and about the experience of what you can um, get with a drone versus to just cast a slide or something like that. Yeah, so so obviously I mean looking at, at this footage here, I mean I think that was that bronzy was about 170 or 180 kilos. Um and obviously um the drone allows you to use far heavier tackle which um enables you to land fish like this. This fish was landed in a place called the duck pond, the car mouth, which must be one of the hardest places in the country to land fish like this. And on normal tackle you have to play them for hours and, and then you'd still probably only have a 10% chance of landing them. And just with the drone and the tackle you're able to use, it just gives you such a, you know, a, a margin for error and, and, and leeway that you can, you know, you've got probably upwards of a 90% chance of landing fish like that if you mm. sort of have any sort of experience. So, um, you know, I think the experience for the angler, being able to fish when he wants to fish and target the fish he wants to target. And then obviously for the well-being of the fish, uh, with the heavy tackle being able to land them so quickly and in the places we sometimes hook them. I think that's been a, you know, obviously a major advantage to, to the drone. Yeah, I, I see that this, this is the second picture now um, of a flatfish. Uh, we saw an, a nice duck ball and now we saw a spear nose here. Uh, so easier to tackle them as well and to get them out quicker because normally these can be a couple of hours of fight. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the first photo you saw was, was a duck ball that a mate of mine hooked um, while fishing for cob. Um, using a drone trying to fish on 
was out of banks for Cobb and uh, it went spectacularly wrong and he ended up hooking that tackle, which was I think 95 or 96 kilos. Um, and on that tackle, to be honest with you, we got very lucky um, to be able to land that fish. But I mean, it was an amazing fish. Um, whereas this picture um, is a spear nose. We got uh, the, I think it was a couple of days before we got locked inside our houses. And um, this, I mean, a spear nose on traditional tackle all the years, if people will tell you spear noses were, they were tough customers, you know, they give you a bit of a hard time. Whereas now with this tackle, a fish like this, a fish like that and the tackle we're using now, <laughs> it's it's like a, a lamb to the slaughter. It doesn't really stand a chance. Um, so from, from that point of view, it's much better for the fish to be able to land them so quickly. Now let's talk a bit about tackle. Um, what type of tackle would you use and, and why? Okay, I think starting with probably the most important part of your tackle is uh, reels. Um, I think the most popular um, or the most practical size is like a 50 two-speed. Um, I use these TLD 50As. I just think they're absolutely bulletproof. You don't need to service them. Uh, they're reliable. That, that's just what I put all my trust in. Uh, the Akuma SLXs are also great reels. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. To be honest with you, when you're fishing with drag, as, with drag um, pressures as high as we're fishing, and the amount of pressure we're putting on the fish, the reel is the absolute critical part of your equipment. Um, then obviously it's your terminal tackle and the way you put that together. And I think the thing that is the least important is actually the fishing rod, to be honest. Um, if, as long as it's stiff enough to be able to set, you know, set a hook like that at a couple of hundred meters, um, the rod is essentially just there to point the line. Um, if, if you're fishing with high enough drag pressures, you're not going to have to lift the rod up anyway. So. So the rod's probably the least important part of the whole um, story. Now let's let's just talk line. With what do you spool the line? Now I, I can see the the fifty sizes and and up. Um, one of the other grills that we looked up looked at uh, is sort of something that I would put on the front of my bucket to winch it out of the sand or something. So so I can see it's really tough tackle there. But what what do you reel it up with? What do you spool it up with? So on my reels, on my 50 size reels, I fish 100 pound braid. Um, and on the, 30, on the 30 size two speeds, I fish 80 pound braid. Um, and then on the front of that, I put, um, on the 50 size, I put um, 8.5 T-line. I put T-line's what I use on every reel I own. Um, I've trusted this stuff with my life. So 8.5 T-line on the, on the 50 size and 7.0 on the, on the 30 size two speeds. And, and that piece in the front is normally less than 100 meters. Um, to be honest with you, what I do is I spool, like, so I spool my reels with 1,000 meters of braid, um, whether it be 80 or 100. 1,000 meters of braid and then I put on the, 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 the mono in the front. And then I cut that mono back until I can reel my leader onto the reel. Um, because a lot of guys spool them up and they literally can't get their, their leaders on the reels because the Dacron part of your wind-ons are so thick. Um, and 2.5 mil leaders are, take up a lot of space. So that piece of mono in the front only needs to be 50 to 70 meters and that's just for stretch. It's that piece of mono in the front that absolutely destroys a fish. That, and you can feel the stretch happen. You can feel when the fish is running out of power. When it's been taking line, and it stops and it hangs there and you can actually feel the way that the script in the line keeps turning its head and every time it tries to turn. Um, I mean, on, on 60 meters, say, or 0.85, you've probably got six to eight meters of stretch um, before it, that it has to pull out of the line every time before it can take a meter of line off your reel. So that piece of line in the front is, is critical as far as I'm concerned. Um, and if you spool it all up right and, you use, and you're not so sound, the, to be honest with you, 100 pound main line or 100 pound braid to 8.5 main line as physically as one person you won't break it so so you, you, there has to be some sort of tackle failure of you know a swivel going or braid touching another fish or something happening but if your tackle is sound and you're not so straight you you can't you won't be able to pull to break it it takes two people to pull that to break it if you get if you get hooked up as we've just as we've discovered what, what, um, is the, what is the longest that I can go with the top shot? 
that you would recommend? Well, you can go. Well, you can go as long as you like. To be honest, I like to use a, a fifteen to eighteen meter leader. Um, and I, I find if I've got a thousand meters of braid with that leader to be able to get it onto my reel, I can have somewhere between fifty and a hundred meters of top shot, depending on what thickness my braid was to start with. You know, whether I went with 8.0, 8.5, or 9.0 mainline. I mean, some guys use um, one mil top shot. So, you know, it, it's all a, it's a balance depending on how each guy, does, what, what guy, components the guys decide to put in. But I find my, my, my personal setup is a thousand meters of braid. That's my start. Then I find I can probably put somewhere around 70 um, top shots. And then I can still fit my leader on the front of it. So, that I would say is a good starting point. Okay, um, and and the leader is about ten meters leader. I like I like to use it between a fifteen and eighteen meters. Okay. Um, I, I, some guys go even longer. Um, and to be honest with you, that is absolutely critical because that just allows as soon as someone gets this leader in his hands, but whoever whoever your wingman is, when this leader is in his hands, the fight's over. It's it's game over. That fish is finished. Okay. It's um it's, it's as good as landed. So the longer you can make it, um, the better it is when that fish is close. Especially if you're fishing off of a, like a deep water point in the transcar mm. or something like that. As soon as someone can as soon as someone can get hold of that leader and control that fish, the it, it'll it'll cut many minutes off the of the amount of time it takes to land it. It it's also clear to me that just looking at this video and this picture that. Um, you want tackle heavy enough so that you don't sit in a situation where you're easily spooled. Exactly, and, and, and that's why, to be honest, like, so this is a perfect example of why I keep harping on at every opportunity I get about, you know, really push your tackle um, as heavy as you can go because, uh, you know, fish like this come along <laughs> and you'll find out you still don't have enough tackle. Um, or your tackle isn't heavy enough. And uh, I just think if you've got, you know, they say with great power comes great responsibility. I think, you know, you basically have unlimited power when you've got this drone. You can fish where you like and when you like and as heavy as you like. So I think it's kind of your responsibility to, to push your tackle um, as far as you can uh, and, and try to put, you know, the vast majority of the fish you hook on, on the beach and, to, and, and as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah, and not leave any, you don't want that leader attached to the, to the fish and out there just because your tackle wasn't heavy enough. Absolutely. You know, I must be honest, uh, there's, there's, there's guys who have uh, they've made sort of slide type devices, like shark savers devices where the trace will drop away and, and stuff. And that's absolutely fine. Um, well, for myself, um, I... I can count on one hand the amount of rigs I've lost in the last number of years. Um, you just you just don't seem to I just just don't seem to lose tackle with when it's when it's this heavy. I mean there has to be catastrophic failure. Sure, hooks pull and stuff like that, but actual cutoffs or leaders leaders getting cut off. It's it's there's such a ma massive margin for error with the, when you use heavy tackle that mistakes like that should happen very seldom. Yeah, so, it um, comes to a man a man to beast fight. Gary, where do I start? I want to buy a drone. I want to buy a fishing drone. Yes, Verna. So the first question we ask a new user is exactly what Greg has been going on about. And that is, what tackle do you have? What type of fish do you want to target? Et cetera, et cetera. And the... Which way drones have, or let's say specifically fishing drones, have changed over the years. Uh, things have uh, been emphasized last year specifically on how, how much weight can this drone pick up. Uh, and we had drones that could pick up six, seven kilos, which we found out very soon that it's just not necessary to have a drone to pick up that kind of weight. So the Average person would say, no, they want to pick up 1.5 kilos somewhere around there. And that would give you a, a size bait pretty much bigger than what you've seen in the video, the, the tuna head. And uh, 
Greg would confirm it, uh, you can catch a very big fish on a small bait. So our feeling is that uh, when a new user comes in, wants to buy a drone, uh, we're very comfortable with the idea of saying, if you're happy to lift 1.5 kilos, you're going to be in the game for the largest of fish. And there's no need to, to risk going for anything bigger than that. Some people insist on the big drones for three, four kilos. And I would normally reserve that situation to someone who's very experienced. If I just looked at that previous one, and here we're going to see that, that that's quite a large chin head there. And um, so what goes out there is already, a, that might be what, a kilo or something, and it's large. Yeah. Sure. Now, that particular drone is one of our older models. Uh, that was the uh, hammerhead. It was called the hammerhead, and that tuna head is going to. That drone couldn't lift more than 1.2 kilo, so so that is under a kilo uh, with the sinker, um, and it just shows you that that in, you know you can aim, uh, drone fish with a bait that size and catch you know huge sharks over 250 kilos. And that starts to become important for us as a manufacturer because it means it's more safe on the whole um, in terms of uh, what people are doing. Yeah, I think it, it looks like um, we tend to overestimate the size or the weight of whatever we want to take out. Because in my mind, that is quite a big piece of bait there and that's not a kilo of bait. And uh, if I look at the, I'm, I'm just looking at the screen here, and I can see that might be going out 200 meters or something, and it's like 30 seconds. So it's fairly, fairly quick. So uh, every angler has their own idea of how far they want to go from 150 meters to 1,000 meters. And <clears throat> what we've seen is that the average is between 250 and 400 meters. Now, I would love to be doing more angling at the coast, but uh, our factory is situated inland, and that's why we rely on the expertise of people like Greg to give us good feedback on uh, where things are happening and uh, the best way to go about drone angling. So, yes, you're 100% right. Uh, uh, we definitely uh, underestimate or rather overestimate the size of a bait that's required. And... Uh, the benefit, though, of going a smaller bait, of course, is that uh, you need fewer batteries and many people uh, want to have more drops. How many times can I drop a bait with a battery? So if you're angling with a smaller bait, you're going to have more efficiency. Okay, now let's just talk about that figure because that's always something that the guys ask. So how many times can I take that tuna head out at 300 meters? Okay, so... In terms of getting people in the picture, we came up with a reference of uh, 750 grams, which is a, uh, what we found to be an average type of bait weight. And we said we'll use 200 meters as a reference point. And a drone like the, the Hammerhead and is battery dependent, uh, would do at least four to six drops in ideal weather conditions. If you can do that uh, with a 750 gram bait and you've got three or four rods, uh, one battery uh, can really um, be enough for a user that's starting out. Uh, however, having an additional battery, uh, if you're a nervous flyer, means that uh, you have the safety margin, uh, rather drop a few less baits than take a chance. Uh, certainly, the technicalities of drones have improved uh, the technology. so. The newer products uh, will prevent the user from taking off if the uh, flight controller senses that the battery level is not correct. So it's taken out the need for the user to actually measure the battery and the whole system checks itself and it will disable you, which is really uh, a great improvement uh, in our newer products. Okay, but, but the drone or the controller doesn't know how far I want to take it out. So... Uh... Uh, the reference is 200 meters and I want to take it out 600 so I get to 400 and the battery's flat. What happens? Does it land in the sea? Okay, fortunately um, it's not programmed to land in the sea and even if it did, um, the new idea behind waterproofing um, would still protect your drone 
although uh, it would take a, a large amount of effort to recover a drone at 600 meters. So all of our products are, are uh, safety governed by the voltage of the battery. So when the system detects a certain battery voltage, it would then initiate a return to uh, a launch mode, return home is also called. And that voltage drop can be affected and it is affected by the, the bait load. So the bigger the bait load, the sooner the voltage would drop. So as long as the user understands uh, um, the voltage drop, uh, you can manage the number of drops very carefully. And our drones are programmed with some very tight uh, um, safety. So we rather go safe than sorry. So the drone would normally return on its own earlier rather than have a problem. Okay, so, so I don't have to worry. So I can send it out and uh, the drone knows how far it's from the, um, uh, from the bank and it's under load. So it will rather be safe than overreaching. So it will come back earlier. Now, when it decides, so it's, an, it's got an auto return. So when it's out too far and it says, oops, I don't have enough battery, it will return. But does it then auto drop the bite or must you be a bit wake up for that? Okay, so right now, there isn't a drone that has an auto bait release with when, it, when the battery is low. Um, that is something we are working on and, and we're pretty confident we will get that right in the next year because uh, we've moved over to a system which allows more for open source programming. The various drones on the market, some of them have different ways of uh, working. Um, the drone would enter a low battery state where it would want to come back but often the drone is quite far and the user may not see that the drone is trying to come back and some flight controllers will allow the user to literally force the drone out. So you could be in a low battery state and uh, you're forcing the drone out and then the drone is gonna lose power and it'll end up landing in the sea. So that is why we've changed over to a new system which disables the user. If the battery is low, then it's low the user is completely disabled and the drone will come and land. And for us, that level of safety improvement uh, means that uh, the investment of a drone is protected. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Greg, I just wanna go back to this, this specific video and I wanna ask you one question, a much debated question in terms of the setup. So how do I set up my gear um, to take out my bait with the, um, with the with a drone. Uh, people talk a lot about the drop distance and, and so forth, bait to, um, uh, to drone and pendulum and everything. What is, what is the truth? Okay, I, I only know my truth. <laughs> um, I, think, I think by far the most sort of popular and accepted method is to have your bait hanging on a drop loop, say somewhere between 10 and 20 meters below your, your, your drone as that minimizes the pendulum effect on it. But since I started this, since Gary came and up here and <laughs> I flew the, my first bait out ever, I've been connecting my, my bait, as you see in that picture there, which is basically, I have a tiny little cable tie which goes through the eye of my hook and my drop loop from the drone would go through the cable tie. Then my sinker goes at the other end of my steel. So that's three to say four meters away um, on the swivel between my, my steel and my leader. and Basically, what I found is that what we is that what we see there. We see there. That's what you see there. The sinker. Yeah, the so sinker. It, like exactly. So, so what what I found is that way my bait and my drone are essentially one thing. Um, I get no pendulum effect whatsoever, and having the sinker at the end of the steel helps sort of stabilize the whole thing. And over and above that, I'll have less drag in the air when I'm flying out because I'm not now having another whole piece of line down to the bait, which is you know, catching wind, et cetera, et cetera. What was the, the sort of icing on the top for me, which really sort of proved that, or to, again, my, my personal feeling that it works, is the stories that other guys have of, let's say you have an overrun on your reel. And I mean, it's, the stories I've heard are horrific. You get an overwind on your reel and then you basically, your drone's going to fall missing. <laughs> That's just how it is. And um, the uh, times I've seen over winds when I've been flying out baits, the way I hook them up, the drone literally, you have an overwind, the drone just pulls the slack out 
yeah. and sort of hold you. There's no bait to swing. There's 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 zero pendulum. So I don't know. I'm, I must admit, I find it surprising that more guys haven't gone this way. But it's been highly publicised drop for loops, and I've sort of I've heard the horror stories. But uh, okay. that's the way I found it, and I've never had a single reason to change. I've never had a single drop or a single flight that was even scary. So. Maybe I've been lucky, but I'm also a nervous flight, so yeah. <laughs> I don't take chocolate. Okay, great. Now, now a question for um, for Gary, and we're running out of time a little bit, so I'm just going to hasten. I'm going to share another screen, and this is this one here, and this is always where my nervousness comes in. What we're seeing here is always my worst fear is to crash the drone in the sea. Um, and uh, disappearing under the under the water. So, where are you with respect to this, Gary? So, we are now probably at our best model ever that Kutakopter has built, and this is the latest model being demoed at a tidal pool on the south coast, where we purposefully crash the drone into the water. You see that it floats, and you then see that it can take off again. Now, we don't encourage intentional water exposure to anybody. The waterproofing on a fishing drone is really there as an insurance policy. If something happens, no one in their right mind wants to expose any electronics of any form to salt water. Besides, your motors are open and, and they can start corroding from day one and they will need to be treated. So we've now... Uh, really up to our product and uh, improved the, the waterproofing and uh, the product has a, um, three waterproof chambers, the main chamber, a battery chamber, and now the, the standard camera chamber, which are all waterproofed compartments that in the event of any type of water exposure, at least all you need to do is uh, flush it down with fresh water and there you go, you should be okay again. Okay, oh, but that, that's great. And that also means that you can fly in the rain, in the mist and things like that without a problem. So we, once again, from a safety point of view, we say if you ended up being in some rain unintentionally where a storm comes over or uh, you're just waiting to fly through some morning mist, you would be okay. But from a safety point of view, it's really not a good idea to fly in any conditions that create a hazard. So, so stay away from mist get out of thunderstorm and rainy conditions as soon as you can for your own safety. My last question, uh, batteries. How many batteries do I need? How long do they last? And uh, how do I charge them if I've walked 500 meters down to the beach and I need more okay. than three or four uh, drops? Yeah, so, to, so batteries really are dependent on your budget. But I would recommend between one and three batteries for the average user. And we can determine how many batteries you need by the type of bait that you think you are going to drop as well. What you see in the picture there was like a gate motor battery that can allow a top up. And that can be very useful because most of the time the drones would land with a battery voltage around the 15 to 30% uh, capacity. So, so that means if you topped it up, it's going to top it up um, in less than half an hour. Uh, um, it's important that batteries are looked after. Most batteries can be charged about 200 to 300 times. However, big baits damage batteries. The bigger your baits, the bigger the load, the more the battery will be damaged. So the important thing is to keep your baits as small as possible for the type of fish you are targeting. Always look after your batteries in terms of putting them on storage charge. That's very important. Don't leave your batteries fully charged. Don't leave them fully empty. Put them on storage charge and top up that storage charge if you're leaving your batteries lying around for months on end as well because they will slowly uh, uh, drop the voltage over time. One area that is uh, often overlooked and that is the charger. If you are a serious angler for drone fishing don't play with the cheapest charger that you can get the one in the picture is like the first entry level basic charger it's really for the sport fisherman who's recreational on every weekend don't get a charger like that if you're in the pro guarding game you're going to need to get a better charger to keep your batteries up to date 
I'll, I'll keep my eye on the post, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Greg, so, so there's your door. Um, this is your setup that you've been using up to now, but uh, I am sure that you are going to use something better from now on. I'm super excited to hear that I'm going to be getting a new charger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Greg, just tell yeah. us a little bit, this, this charger of yours and, and the battery, um, taking it down, how well, did it suit so, you? Just to show it in scale, that's the size of the battery I carry with me. Um, it's a 17 amp hour. And um, I'm a, what does Gary say, I'm, an, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a nervous or a cautious flyer. So if I'm flying any sort of shark baits, I, I fly one drop per battery. And then I bring it back, I put another battery in and I top up the one. It normally takes somewhere between 12 and 17 minutes to top up. Um, and to be honest, fishing even with three guys, um, on the basis, you got to remember your baits lie for a while. So you drop three baits. I mean, you're not going to be reeling them in every 10 minutes. So you've got time to top your batteries up. I have yet to run this thing to the point where it won't charge a battery. So that's nine or 12 re or top ups, um, which I, I, I run six batteries. But to be honest with you, two of them normally sit as, as a spare in case I need to do another quick drop while one is charging or whatever. So okay. in reality, I run with probably four batteries. Um, if there's two of us fishing, I think you could probably get away with just flopping two or three batteries over. But having a system like this, it's just so light and compact, um, rather than carrying a car battery around with you, you know, it weighs 27 kilos. Um, Greg, uh, the, the setup that you, that you carry, um, when you go to the beach and especially walking along, do, do you use a specific um, backpack or rack bag or a trolley or something? How do you carry that along? If I, if I can get away with it and there's enough surf, I'll definitely use a trolley. That's uh, first price. Um, otherwise, I, I use a normal H-frame um, as a backpack. And then obviously, you just try to shed. Whoever's got to carry the battery doesn't have to carry the base. <laughs> so the other guy's got to carry the base. Um, or whatever way. But if you're on your own, you're pretty stuffed and you got to carry it all. Then you find you take less base. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, I can imagine. Yeah, so I think if you, can, if you can use a trolley, that's obviously first price. Uh, otherwise, you're yeah, a decent age frame. Okay, let's talk about the last thing on, on um, my mind, but I think uh, one very important one, and that is uh, fish care and our responsibility as anglers when it comes to targeting these big fish. Well, I mean, I think obviously, you know, if, if you're going to take the responsibility of sticking a hook in something's face and dragging it onto the beach, you've got to be responsible with trying to get it back um, as safely as possible. And if you see there, I, I try to move this fish as little as possible where there's not water to help support its weight. I think that's the main thing. Don't drag fish on dry land. And you can see this fish is still so awake, it throws me off. I can hardly control it. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, firstly, fish safety, don't move it onto dry land, drag it miles up the beach, try to keep it close to the water. Um, you know, don't land it on rocks if you can get to the beach. I know there's many places where that's not always possible, especially on the wild coast. But obviously, if you can, try to get it to a piece of sand. Um, you know, use barbless hooks so you can take the hooks out, you don't need to cut the steel off. Uh, fish with circle hooks so you don't gut hook them, etc. etc. Land them as quickly as possible using the right tackle. And then, obviously, from a you know, the drone also allows inexperienced guys to get um, involved with some of these big fish. And I think from, from that side, you know, just angler safety, you know, especially with a fish like, like raggies, uh, make sure you stay away from all the sharp ends and uh, you know, keep your wits about you. You don't, I find often you see like three guys jumping on a shark and trying to drag it back. I think that's a risky for disaster. Um, have one guy who's sort of, you know, uh, masterminding this the thing and maybe someone to help him if it's too heavy. And uh, just like, yeah, look after yourself. That's obviously vitally important, especially if you're far away, like in a place like the sky. You need to make sure you're going to keep safe too, you know. So, yeah. Okay, now, Greg, if, if I go down to the East Coast or I want to go a bit of shark fishing, um, who do I contact? Um, what do I do? Well, you can, they can find me on, on Facebook, East Coast Angling Guides on Facebook, um, or on Instagram, um, it's at EC Angling Guides. 
And then as, as much as we've just sort of briefly touched on the tackle setup now, if they go onto YouTube, um, East Coast Angling Guides on YouTube, there's a three-part series there, which is quite long. So it's perfect for now when you're trying to kill time, when you're under house arrest. Uh, I think they're like 40 minutes per episode or per, per um, um, yeah. And uh, those go into absolute detail from each, every single knot to how you put your braid on, to how you join everything, how you make a trace, how you make a wind on leader. Every single part of the system you need to be successful with this is, is in there. So if the guys are interested, that'll be well worth their time. Go have a look at that series as well. Okay. Greg, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for sharing your, um, both your views and your experience with us. And uh, thank you for making yourself available. Gary? Thanks for having me. It's been good. Ah, yes. Thanks. So, uh, if the guys want to buy a drone, what do they do? Well, we'd be happy if they do contact us uh, because we're yeah, in trying times. You know, right now our factory is closed with the lockdown. But uh, we'd be happy for anybody to contact us and uh, we can arrange then to show them what we're doing. Um, they can go onto our webpage, kutacopter.co.za or dronemasters.co.za, both will work. And you can check out our products there and get a lot of information. All the specs are there, um, exactly what they can do. Is, is there a phone number that they can call if they need some um, advice or they need a drone urgently? Yeah, they can easily phone me. Uh, my number is on our website. Uh, I can give it to you now, 083-269-6785. You can give us a call, but please, everybody be patient. You know, you're not going to get anything for some time at the moment. Uh, the, the whole supply chain has been disrupted from uh, China and getting the drone production smooth is quite challenging at this point. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will also put the links on here and we'll put the phone numbers uh, when you want to uh, speak to Gary or to Greg and uh, gladly go about. Um, it is also my view that it's not the last time we speak about drones. I think we have just barely scratched the surface and I think there's uh, probably a sequel coming up. Thank you very much for everybody that watched. Uh, thank you. For joining us tonight uh, so go there and like our page and uh, subscribe to our youtube channel we'll see you around thank you be safe stay inside and uh, spend good time with your families Ciao for now thank you